Okay, welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Justin White, a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco. Tops is being organized by myself, Mike Pesco from Georgia State University, C. Shang from the Ohio State University, and Catherine McLean from Temple University. T today's presentation is a workshop format. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available on the TOPS website, top, tobaccopolicy.org. TOPS will be selecting speakers for our winter series, seminar series soon. Please submit pre potential presentations through tobaccopolicy.org by October 13th to be considered for the next slate of speakers. And now I'll turn it over to, uh, for today's presentation to our moderator, Catherine McLean of Temple University to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Justin. David Ashley, our speaker today, is currently a research professor in the School of Public Health at Georgia State University. He received his PhD in physical chemistry in 1982 from Emory University. He spent 27 years from 1983 to 2010 at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for Environmental Health. During this time, he carried out research on the impact of tobacco chemicals in the environment on health developed methods and systems to respond to chemical and biological terrorism, and built a tobacco product and biomarker laboratory. He has performed extensive research related to the impact of cigarette design and contents on emissions from tobacco products, how people use tobacco products, and resulting biomarkers of exposure. From 2010 until 2017, he was the inaugural director of the Office of Science at the Center for Tobacco Products, CTP, of the US Food and Drug Administration. In that role, he was instrumental in carrying out the regulatory authorities of the 2000 law, which gave FDA authority to regulate tobacco products. He has published over 160 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters related to, pardon me, related, uh, related to um, biophysics, environmental chemicals, biomarkers of exposure, and the uh, constituents of tobacco and tobacco smoke. He retired in September or May 2016 at the Public Health Service rank of Assistant Surgeon General. He, was presented, he has presented extensively at scientific meetings on the chemistry of tobacco and tobacco smoke and biomarkers of exposure. He serves on the World Health Organization WHO Study Group for Tobacco Product Regulation and was chair of the WHO Tobacco Laboratory Network from 2006 until 2010. Our discussant today is C. Shang from The Ohio State University. We will have two pauses during the seminar to allow for clarifying questions, but we'll hold non-clarifying questions until the Q&A period that will follow Dr. Ashley's presentation. Dr. Ashley, thank you for presenting for us today. Well, thanks. First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, a lot of what I will be talking about today is experience that I had when I was at FDA and um, what I learned in those in there. Um, I had the opportunity for seven years to work with some really, really terrific scientists at FDA and trying to understand the, the connection between science and law and how you actually implement science in a regulatory um, area. And so um, I'm very excited to uh, be here and talk to you today. So this um, slide has my disclosures on it. And this slide explains a little bit about where I hope to go with this presentation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna give a background on FDA CTP regulation and exactly what that means. I'm gonna talk about the process of regulatory decision-making and then the role of scientific studies in tobacco regulatory decision-making. How does science fit into those decisions? And then I'm gonna to try to give some, a few examples of how science influences tobacco regulatory decisions. I have to acknowledge that I'm gonna be speaking from a US standpoint. So there are different laws in different countries. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today doesn't really apply in other countries, but hopefully there are some lessons that we're gonna be learned from this anyway. 
In 2009, through an act of Congress, the Center for Tobacco Products was given the authority to regulate products that are made or derived from tobacco and intended for human consumption. That original law regulated cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, roll your own tobacco, and smokeless tobacco. There's a couple of things that are notably not included in that list. One of those is um, cigars, um, which uh, at that time a lot were primarily traditional large cigars and were not included. The other thing that's not included in that list is e-cigarettes, and e-cigarettes largely didn't even exist at that time. And so when Congress wrote the law, they didn't include that, but they included cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, roll your own tobacco, and smokeless tobacco. FDA was given authority in the Tobacco Control Act. It was given authority to gather information, to get knowledge on regulated products, to do product review, which we will talk about in a lot, uh, lot more detail, including restricting product changes to protect public health and pro prohibiting modified risk claims. It also given authority to put together product standards, and those can be restricting marketing and distribution or standards in intended to decrease the harms of tobacco products. They were given the authority to uh, force compliance with the law. They were given authority to educate the public, and they were given authority to, to carry out research, to expand the science base for regulatory action. As part of that law, um, the, the, a new standard was set. That new standard is popularly called the Population Health Standard. And the standard is phrased throughout the law in a lot of places called appropriate for the detection of public health. And that is described in the statute as the risks and benefits to the population as a whole, the increase in the light or decrease in the likelihood of people stopping use of tobacco products, and the increase or decrease in the likelihood of people starting to use tobacco products. This standard is not the same as the safety and efficacy standard that's used throughout most of FDA. And so this introduced this brand new standard that FDA had to develop the whole thinking behind how that was going to be executed. Following uh, implementation of the Tobacco Control Act, there were a lot of changes that occurred in the tobacco product market, where previously small filtered cigars really were a small niche market and really were not around a lot. A lot of cigarette manufacturers and other companies started developing flavored cigars in place of their flavored cigarettes, which had been banned by the act. Cigarette uh, manufacturers started experimenting with new smokeless products, such as dissolvables like uh, tobacco sticks, strips, orbs, um, in an attempt to reverse their loss of revenue due to lower cigarette sales. And then e-cigarettes began to rise in prominence, from, per, first from independent manufacturers, and then most of those e-cigarette companies were eventually acquired by tobacco companies and large cigarette manufacturers. The original, as I said before, the original Tobacco Control Act gave FDA authority over cigarette tobacco, roll your own, smokeless, but they also allowed FDA to deem other tobacco products that the secretary could rationalize by regulation that they should be subject to the chapter. So in June 2016, FDA passed what's called the deeming regulation, and that specifically identifies other products anything that is made or derived for tobacco to be under FDA's tobacco regulatory authority, as long as those products are not um, medicinal products. So um, the regulation went into effect in 2016 and so far has survived numerous court cases. Now deeming um, includes, again, a wide array of products, e-cigarettes, it now includes all cigars, pipe tobacco, nicotine gels, water pipe, water pipe tobacco, dissolvables that were already not under FDA's authority, and future tobacco products. No, no one thing is very important to understand that most people miss is that no newly deemed products that were introduced after February 15, 2007 are on the market legally. They're only on the market because FDA has chosen to not enforce that parts of the law. For those products to be legally marketed, they must undergo scientific review and be authorized for marketing by FDA. Before we go any further, um, I just want to give a little background on people so people will understand. Um, there are certain aspects of um, decision making in regulatory uh, agencies, and one of those is the development of rules or regulations. 
rules or regulations are delegated legislation, which is drafted by subject matter experts to enforce a statutory instrument, the primary legislation. So the Tobacco Control Act would be that primary legislation. But in order to um, describe the details and enforce the law, um, FDA or other regulatory or, or organizations will develop rules and regulations. Now those rules and regulations require notice and comment rulemaking before it's finalized. But once those regulations are in force, the regulation carries the weight of law. The problem is regulation takes a long time. There are a lot of steps involved in regulation. It doesn't happen quickly. You have a lot of steps for a draft rule. You have a lot of steps for a final rule. And even if the, when the, once the final rule is completed, you have implementation. And there's usually a delay in implementation anywhere from 90 days to three years. After that process, then there are lawsuits that come. And so the regulation process is a very slow, cumbersome process, though it is very important because as I said earlier, once it is in place, then it carries the weight of law. By contrast, there's another approach and that is guidance. Guidance is much quicker, but guidance only explains FDA's thinking when finalized. It does not carry the weight of law. It doesn't require notice and comment rulemaking, it doesn't require all those steps that I uh, listed on the previous slide. It describes how regulated industry could comply with the law, but it allows for alternatives. And so guidance is a way for FDA to get out information quicker, but again, it doesn't carry the weight of law. Now I'm gonna talk about two primary regulatory actions as I go forward. One is gonna be product review. Product review is one by one product decisions. Product review evaluates products on an individual basis. And in this case, the evidentiary burden is on the applicant. So the applicant must provide the evidence to support product review. As of June 2019, FDA had removed from the market or prevented from being marketed 2,697 new tobacco products. I imagine a lot of people are not aware of that. Um, it's not something that FDA talks about a lot but over 2,500 tobacco products. And that was June of 2019, which is the last numbers that I have. I imagine there are more decisions that have been made since then. But product review is one certain regulatory action. A second is product standards. Product standards can apply to all products instead of individual products, or it can apply to groups of products. But in this case, the evidentiary burden is on FDA, which means FDA must prove the point around product standards. As of October 2019, FDA had issued a final and then reissued a proposed product standard for graphic health warnings on cigarette packaging and advertising and a proposed rule for NNN and smokeless tobacco. And I'm actually going to use some examples from those decisions FDA made when I begin talking about examples as we go forward. Um, I want to open it up now. Um, if people have specific questions that they would like answered, if there's some, something confusing there that I can address, I'd be glad to address those. Kathleen, Catherine? Thank you, Dr. Ashley. We have uh, two questions that I think are clarifying. Was the guidance that the FDA used to try to get flavored e-cigarettes cartridge uh, removed? Yes, that was a guidance. So FDA is explaining what they were doing, but, but it all goes back to something I said earlier, which is the, the realization that no products that are, were on the market after February 15th, 2007 and newly deemed, unless they go through FDA authorization or on the, on the market legally. So legally, none of those products are allowed at all. The only reason they are able to be on the market right now is because FDA has chosen to not enforce that part of the law. So they can issue guidance in that case because the law and the regulation is already in place. It's in place through the deeming regulation. Thank you so much. We have two quick clarifying questions. Where does the 2697 number of products um, removed or not introduced come from? Is that something that's publicly available or within FDA? It actually comes from a slide um, that I saw at, I believe it was SRNT um, um, by Ben Appleberg. Ben Appleberg actually put that slide up and I copied that number down quickly because I had had an old number. So Fantastic. Ben, I put a slide up in a meeting that I was at. Thank you so much. One final quick question. Could you briefly, briefly review deeming again for the audience? So when FDA had, was originally given authority under the Tobacco Control Act, it was given authority over cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, 
smokeless tobacco um, and roll your own tobacco. So that was what the authority that was given to FDA. But that was because most of the other issues of the products were not considered to be a major public health problem. Since then, those products have become more and more of a, an issue. Cigars, e-cigarettes are clearly public health issues. So FDA used the authority that was suggested in the Tobacco Control Act that they could deem other products to be under their authority. And they wrote a regulation that then brought all products that are made from tobacco, um, excuse me, made or derived from tobacco and are not medicinal to be under FDA's regulatory authority. Thank you very much. I'll just have one more and then we'll hold the rest until the end. Are nicotine products where nicotine is derived from non-tobacco sources also under the tobacco definition covered by the same law? Very, very good question. Um, and I will probably need a lot of discussion about that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say briefly. Right now, the FDA's um, tobacco authority only, to prov only applies to products that are made or derived from tobacco. So if you synthesize nicotine in the laboratory and don't derive it from tobacco, then it is not under FDA's authority. But the whole purpose of FDA developing and the Tobacco Control Act going into place was because the courts decided that it was the intention of Congress to not include products that are not, that, well, let me see if I can get this, say this right. It was the intention of Congress that products that came from tobacco would be regulated separately. So in my opinion, and I actually uh, wrote a paper um, on, on this issue. I think I wrote the paper, but it may have been somebody else. Um, specifically that if nicotine is not derived from tobacco, then it actually should be a drug. And it should be subject to FDA's um, drug authority. And so it, it, it's, it's almost a choice. Um, if someone is going to manufacture and use nicotine, they actually going to have to be under the tobacco authority or under the drug authority. Now that's not a legal decision. Um, that's just my opinion on that issue. Anything like that would have to go through the courts and be decided. But nicotine, not from tobacco, does meet, in my opinion, the requirements to as a as a drug. Thank you very much. We have several other great questions, but I will hold those until the end uh, for discussion. Thank you. All right, sounds great. Glad to have questions. So first thing I'm going to talk about is pre-market review. Now there are five different pre-market review decisions that can be made, include investigational tobacco products, new product review, substantial equivalence, exemption from substantial equivalence, modified risk tobacco products. As I said before, for all of these, the applicant must provide adequate evidence. The evidentiary burden is on the applicant, but FDA uses scientific research to evaluate that evidence. I don't have time to go into all of these. It would actually take hours for me to explain all the details behind this. So I don't have time to go into it, but I am gonna talk a little bit about certain aspects of those things. First is the statutory questions. So for a new product to go on the market, the question that has to be answered is, is the marketing of a new product appropriate for the protection of public health? So one of the decisions that had to be addressed as we were looking at this question was, what does that mean? All, all that is described in the statute is the words appropriate for the protection of public health with the, the caveats that I had before. And so FDA had to make a decision about what that really, really means. And so as we were going through those deliberations, we came to the conclusion that having um, hundreds of thousands of people dying every year from tobacco use was not appropriate for protection of public health. So any new product that goes on the market has to be able to demonstrate that it is likely to reduce the death and disease from tobacco. The second question is under substantial equivalence. And that is, do differences between a new product and a predicate product raise different questions of public health? And that's an interesting phrase, different questions of public health, because it can be interpreted again in several different ways. One could be, does it raise new questions of public health that have not been ever raised before? FDA interpreted this question to mean, does this product cause, is this product likely to cause any additional um, negative, any additional harm to current users? If it's the same, then that is not a different question of public health. Another one is under the modified risk tobacco product application. And it says, 
Will the product as it is actually used by consumers significantly reduce the harm and risk of tobacco related disease to individual tobacco users and benefit the health of the population as a whole? Clearly the, the phrase as interpreted by FDA is benefiting the health of the population as, as, a, as a whole means there has to be an improvement in health. But the other phrase which is actually important is as it is actually used by consumers. So this is not laboratory measurements. These are not measurements that are done on a specific group of people that have been pulled aside and given products out of the context. But this is as actually used by consumers. So I'm going to talk about some of these things again as we go forward. Um, a lot of things go into a new product authorization decision. And I've actually highlighted four groups that have to be addressed. The first of those is current smokers. You have to understand what's going to happen with current smokers. You also have to understand if there is poly use of product, use of multiple products, and what happens to those people who are using those products. Second is adult non-users, people who are not using, who may start initiation, and then youth and adolescents, which clearly has risen in importance since e-cigarettes have gone on the market and there's been this huge rise in e-cigarettes among youth and adolescents. So there are a lot of factors that go into making those product Now, as you're making product review considerations, there's really something you really focus on. So the thing that's really focusing on is morbidity and mortality. What, is, what would be the effect of authorizing that product to go on the market on morbidity and mortality? Unfortunately, there's usually not any data on morbidity and mortality for a new tobacco product that's never been on the market before. What you generally get is information on materials, ingredients, design, composition, constituents, other features, and marketing. So somehow you've got to connect the information you get to the public health result. And the way that's done is through scientific uh, studies. So you study appeal, you study addictiveness, use behavior, exposure, pharmacokinetics, toxicity, perception, initiation, cessation. And then you try to take the information that you get from the company and then through scientific analysis, understand how that's gonna affect morbidity and mortality. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges that the science group at FDA faces is trying to make those connections and understand the likelihood of information ingredients on the resulting morbidity and mortality. Now, let me talk about an example. And this came out fairly recently. So we have ICOS. And let me make sure I get my dates right here. Um, so on April 30th, 2019, following several years long evaluation, FDA issued a new product marketing authorization order for Philip Morris heated tobacco product ICOS. Then on July 7th, 2020, FDA issued a modified risk order for this same product. The ICOS system includes heat sticks, which are plugs of reconstituted tobacco sheet blended with glycerin and rolled and bound in a hollow acetate tube and outer cigarette paper with a polyacetic acid filler. Um, filter. To obtain nicotine from the product, the heat sticks are inserted into the ICOS holder, which contains a blade that pierces into the tobacco plug. You press a button, causes the blade to heat to temperatures not exceeding 300 degrees centigrade, releasing nicotine and other chemical constituents in an aerosol, which is inhaled by the user. So that's ICOS, and ICOS has received a new product and a modified risk tobacco product um, authorization to go into the market. Most of the data and the most um, the strongest data that FDA relied on when they made the decision was on biomarkers and exposure. And this shows two of those studies um, looking at per percent reduction in biomarkers of exposure. Um, one of those in study A was conducted in Japan, the other was co conducted in the US. And for most of the biomarkers of exposure that we are familiar with that have been, um, been analyzed for cigarette smoke, those values were, were significantly lower. A lot of them down, almost down to 100% lower. And so that was data that was provided by the industry to FDA. We'll go back. But if you remember, one of the issues is that I talked about before was as it is actually used by consumers. And so it's really important to understand how ICOS is actually used by consumers. And, and FDA in their um, application to, uh, to uh, excuse me, uh, Philip Morris and their application to FDA provided several studies. 
Um, one was a 90-day U.S. actual use trial where they found that if you give ICOS to current cigarette users, most of those cigarette users are still smoking cigarettes um, at the end of those 90 days. So almost 63% were predominantly smoking cigarettes. About 22% were smoking between 30 and 70% ICOS and the rest cigarettes. So there were not that many people who actually switched. Matter of fact, only 7.5% were using ICOS at least 95% of the time of them using tobacco products. There was a Japanese cross-sectional study which found that about 92% of heated tobacco product users reported dual use. And there was a four week whole offer test in five different locations where between 4.3 and 15.7% of the people actually switched completely. The rest of them either went back to smoking cigarettes or they were dual users. So there are not that many people that are switching um, from these products. What would be ideal here is to understand exactly what kind of biomarkers expo of exposure occur with dual use. That's really what's needed. Unfortunately, from what I can tell, there have been no studies on dual use. Philip Morris didn't provide this data to FDA, and I'm not aware of any independent studies that have looked at this question to see what um, the biomarkers of exposure occur when you get dual use. But fortunately, there is an example that we can use and though it's not heated tobacco products like ICOS, it's actually e-cigarettes. And so there has been a lot of studies do done on other products that by themselves show much lower levels of biomarkers of exposure, but that have also been evaluated in dual users. And this is that data. Now, again, this is not ICOS, but this is e-cigarettes and, and dual use behavior. And what has been found in several studies is that a person that smokes an e-cigarette by themselves has a much lower level of exposure to a lot of different chemicals than, um, uh, than smoking cigarettes. But dual users generally have the same or maybe even slightly more exposure to biomarkers than people that just smoke cigarettes alone. So when FDA did this review, they did authorize these products for marketing but they do note several places in their analysis. The observational studies reported by the applicant suggest that dual use is a predominant pattern of ICOS use. The evidence is not sufficient to demonstrate that dual use is associated with a meaningful reduction in exposure. Dual use is not likely to provide a benefit over exclusive smoking. And there's potential concern related to consumer understanding of the difference between exclusive use and dual use. So when FDA authorized these products to go on the market, they put some caveats on there and they required some studies. So there's some studies that are required for the companies to provide back to FDA as these products went on the market. And the products were designed to observe behavior over a sufficient period of time to examine the extent to which dual use of ICOS and combusted cigarettes is a transitional versus a stable pattern of use. For example, so are people who are on cigarettes and they're, do they move completely to ICOS use or do they become dual users long-term? What we really need some studies on is real world use behavior, exclusive or dual use. We need to look at appeal to adolescents and the health risk for exclusive and dual use. So FDA put some caveats on that authorization and it's gonna take some time to find out exactly what's gonna be the overall effect. I will stop there and try to address a few more questions if we can. Great, thank you so much. Um, just uh, one audience member uh, stated that PMI did submit an amendment with dual use using BOE data. Um, so I'm not sure if you um, if that's an update, but that was something that was, was noted. Another audience member had a question about um, the definition of dual use uh, and the percentages used to pr comprise your estimate. If you could maybe speak to those, that would be great. Yeah, I'd be very interested. If there's been a dual use study done with, um, e with uh, heated tobacco products and with cigarettes, I'd be very interested in seeing that. I've looked for that and I've not seen that. So I'd be very interested in seeing that. The percentages that I listed up there were the percentages and the data provided by Philip Morris. They were not percentages that I came up. That was their own definitions. For me personally, I would have been much more strict about that. I would have considered exclusive use to be exclusive use. Um, they use those definitions because I personally believe it made their data look better. 
um, which is part of the purpose, the purpose of what you're doing when you're trying to convince a, a, a regulatory agency. But so those were definitions that came from Philip Morris and not definitions that I came up with. Are we ready to move on, Catherine? Oh, oh thanks very much for that. Just one more quick clarifying question. Okay. Um, are you, I know that you're, this, uh, uh, this presentation or workshop is taking a U.S. focus, uh, but one audience, members is, is, uh, one audience member is interested to know if there is international data on steam cigarette popularity or use. You cited some statistics, but do you have a feel that there's good information from an international perspective on that? There is some fairly good information. The problem is heated tobacco products, though they're being marketed worldwide, they're really not, they haven't been taken up very well. There's really good heated tobacco product use in Japan. About 85, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, 85% of heated tobacco use was just in Japan. There is also some fairly good um, uh, prevalence of the, the product in Korea. Other countries, it's just these products are not being used a lot. And so there is some data from other countries but it's very small because the prevalence of use is small. Japan is a very interesting uh, case because in Japan, e-cigarettes are not allowed to have nicotine. So if you're a cigarette smoker and you want a product that is not as offensive, it's more socially acceptable, you can't, and you still want nicotine, you can't you choose e-cigarettes. And so a lot of those are people are choosing to use um, heated tobacco products instead. And, and most, but again, most of those people are dual using the products and not using them exclusively. Great, thanks. Just one more quick question. Um, could you speak at all about the study designs that the FDA CTP is using? Are they, these studies using experimental or quasi-experimental methods in particular? None of the data I've talked about so far is FDA work. Um, that, that work is either independent analysis or work by the tobacco industry. And so, um, FDA does actually sponsor research. It sponsors a lot of research. When I was there, we were putting out um, several hundred million dollars of research. And so it was all kinds of experimental data. It was quantitative data, qualitative data, laboratory data, um, biomarkers of exposure. There was a huge wide range of data. And so it covered pretty much the whole gamut, all the way from engineering to um, statistics. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll continue and hold these, the other excellent questions until the end, thank you. Okay, sure. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna talk about product standards. So I was talking about product review and now we're gonna talk about product standards. And as I said before, for product standards, the evidentiary burden for those is on FDA. So FDA has to prove that that product standard is appropriate for protection of public health. That same phrase occurs throughout the um, the Tobacco Control Act. And there are certain things which are particularly identified specifically in the, in the uh, Tobacco Control Act. That includes nicotine yields, the reduction or elimination of constituents, including smoke constituents, construction components, ingredients, additives, constituents, and properties of tobacco products, provisions for testing or measuring characteristics, restrictions on sale and distribution, and the form and content of labeling for the proper use of the product. So those are expressly listed in the statute. One of the great things is that gives FDA a lot of leeway, a lot of things they can try to address through product standards. But remember, product standards are regulations. Regulations are very hard to bring about. There's, it's a multi-year process, and even after that multi-year process, it's gonna be years before those product standards go in place. So they're not, FDA won't put out lots of product standards. They have to be very, very, um, targeted about what product standards they want to put out because of the work that's involved in that. Now, the Tobacco Control Act also lists certain limitations. And the limitations they list is FDA can't ban certain sets of products like all cigarettes or all smokeless tobacco. They can't do that. And they also can't require the reduction of nicotine yields of a tobacco product to zero. So they cannot say products have to be completely nicotine free that, those, that, that they can't generate any nicotine, but that doesn't say that they can't reduce nicotine yields very low. And so there is again some leeway in, in, in that wording also. Now, when you're looking at product standards, it's several decision points that are have, gonna have to be made. 
and it all focuses on the fact that once the standard is in place, FDA is going to have to be able to answer the question, does a specific marketed product meet the standard? If it doesn't meet the standard, it comes off the market. If it meets the standard, it's allowed to stay on the market. So FDA has got to be able to answer that question. So to answer that question, the standard itself has got to be justifiable. It's got to be necessary. It's got to be appropriate. It's got to be unambiguous. It's got to be measurable and it's got to be quantifiable. And so as the standard is being developed, all these things are considered to make sure the st standard is explicit so that when a particular product is being evaluated, you can say, yes, it meets the standard or no, it does not meet the standard. So I'm gonna give an example. The example I'm gonna give is about tobacco specific nitrosamines. Now tobacco specific nitrosamines are known carcinogens in tobacco. They're in all kinds of tobacco, um, both um, uh, smokeless tobacco, uh, cigarette tobacco, every tobacco has uh, tobacco specific nitrosamines. All other things remaining the same, removing nitrosamines from the tobacco would reduce the risk of cancer from tobacco use. That, and note the caveat, all things staying the same. But the levels of tobacco and tobacco vary widely. Now this is actually tobacco smoke. It's from a paper that we published a lot of years ago, um, over 12 years ago, um, looking at tobacco and smoke. But the same thing is true for tobacco in the, uh, excuse me, for nitrosamines in the tobacco itself. But the levels of nitrosamines vary with the tobacco. And this is just a little bit of a blow up. So if you've got a product that's primarily burly tobacco, it's got very high levels of nitrosamines. If you've got a product that's very mainly bright tobacco, it's got low levels of nitrosamines. And so the tobacco itself determines how much nitrosamines are in, are in the uh, tobacco and eventually in the smoke itself. Now, in addition to the tobacco type, which I just talked about, there are other factors that also impact the levels of nitrosamines in tobacco. It includes the growing conditions, the curing process, the production process, whether you're whether pasteurized or heat treated, and then storage. So there's a lot of factors that can change the levels of nitrosamines in smokeless tobacco. And this is an important aspect of developing a standard because it identifies that there are ways that companies can actually reduce nitrosamines. It's not necessary that nitrosamines be at the high level that they're at. When you look at NN and smokeless tobacco in the US, there are some pretty high differences in levels. So for example, dry snuff has very high levels of tobacco specific nitrosamines, whereas the product called snus has very low levels. And so another important factor is not only can you reduce it, but there are products on the market already that have a wide range of nitrosamine levels. So that helps to explain that if the standard goes into place, that companies can actually make the change. It's not impossible for them to make this adjustment. One of the important aspects in writing this law was the difference between products in the US and products in other parts of the world. And what you see, the, 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 the four, um, excuse me, the, the ones over on the left, under US, above USA all, those are the levels of nitrosamines in SNUS products in the United States, and then the other three are from Northern Europe, um, Sweden particularly. And even certain products like those SNUS products, which I said a minute ago, have low levels of nitrosamines, are higher in the United States than they are in Northern Europe. So generally the nitrosamine levels in smokeless tobacco in the US are very high. Those in Sweden and other parts of, of that are used in Northern Europe are very low. And what's important here is esophageal cancer risk is related to where the smokeless tobacco is being used. And I've taken a, some, uh, a figure and actually shrunk it down here. What you see on the top is relative risk. And the relative risk of cancer, esophageal cancer in the US is significantly higher than the relative risk of esophageal cancer in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia. And that's primarily um, from everything we can understand, the, uh, uh, a factor of the nitrosamine levels. So you see what the levels look like in the US, and those are what the levels look like in, in Sweden. One of the most important questions that arose as this um, standard was being developed 
is the breadth of the standard. And this is data that was done in, by Arena Stepanov and presented at an SRNT meeting uh, several years ago. And what you see on the left are tertiles of um, lung cancer um, prevalence, lung cancer adjusted odds ratio, and levels of urinary NNAL, which is a biomarker of NNK exposure, and on the right, urinary NNN, which is a biomarker of NNN exposure. And the results are significantly different. As the levels of NNK, one of the two tobacco-specific nitrosamines, goes up, it levels, the odds ratio of getting lung cancer goes up. As the levels of NNN stay the set or, or go up, the, the um, likelihood or the odds ratio for lung cancer do not change. Conversely, when the um, levels of NNN go up, the, this is over on the right, the levels of lung cancer, the odds ratio for lung cancer do not go up, but for esophageal cancer do go up. And so since this um, product standard was all about oral and esophageal cancer, it was appropriate to regulate NNN and not to re regulate NNK. And so the data pointed FDA to exactly what the breadth of the standard would be. And this is the standard. It's been put out as a proposed rule. The proposed rule is out there. Don't know exactly, I don't know exactly when FDA is gonna go ahead and move, try to move from a proposed rule to a final rule. Um, but the proposed rule is out there and notice that it is just for N nitroso nor nicotine, N and N, and it is not for all nitrosamines. So um, it is very important to understand that FDA has that authority. They use that authority and base it on the scientific science. Some of that science is coming from the industry. That science is evaluated at FDA. A lot of that science is being developed by FDA to use themselves. And that science comes to bear on all kinds of questions. These questions around regulatory actions are very complicated and, and requires good, solid, sound science in making these decisions. Because most of these decisions are going to end up in, in the courts. And when these things end up in the courts, then FDA has got to have the science to support those decisions and defend them in court. And I'll be glad to answer any other questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ashley. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll give our discussant, C. Shang from The Ohio State University, a couple of minutes to respond, and then we'll move on to the excellent audience questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding whether the FDA uh, CTP will provide guidance on the methodologies used in informing regulatory uh, actions. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because uh, I myself uh, are doing uh, some discrete choice experiments um, research and then uh, the DCE, if you look at the history of these methods, it has been uh, very much divided by the FDA scientists and their task force. For example, if you look at the history, uh, the Center for Devices and the Radiological Health and the Center for Biologics uh, Evaluation and Research, they are very engaged in developing, for example, how to uh, methodologies to incorporate um, patient preference in their risk benefit analysis. So I just want to hear your thoughts about whether CTP is gonna be that involved in terms of guiding on the, uh, the methodologies and its application in science. Okay, um, one thing, just make sure uh, I'm very clear on, I'm not at CTP anymore. So what I'm talking about is my guess as to yeah. what CTP might be doing. Yeah. So it's Thank just guesswork right now. Um, since I haven't been there for three years. Um, CTP, I believe, will eventually put out those kind of guidances. Um, I believe they would really like to. Right now, the, the, the center is under tremendous um, uh, workload in trying to deal with thousands of e-cigarettes, evaluating those e-cigarettes, continuing to evaluate um, applications for cigarettes and smokeless tobacco and other things. They're trying to constantly put out as much guidance as possible. Uh, but it's going to take some time. Um, a lot of the guidance they're putting out now is trying to direct people in putting in applications and how to get those applications in, in as good a shape as possible to try to speed up part of that review, particularly that um, product review process. So 
they're in the process of putting out that guidance. One of the other things is the other centers have a big advantage in that they've been in place for a long time. And so they've learned. What the way a lot of the FDA centers work is they, they begin to work through a lot of the workload and they learn from that. They see how people are doing things, they, they learn from that, and then they see things that, oh, that was a really good way to do that, let's incorporate that. And so as the time goes on, FDA will be learning from the whole process of review and eventually, I believe, incorporate those into guidances so people can be better informed and to do better um, experimental methodology. Thank you very much. I'll hand uh, this, uh, this to the next session to Catherine so we can answer more Q&A questions. Great, thank you so much, C. Uh, so I'll just begin to uh, go through some of the really great audience questions. Uh, thank you all for your, for your comments. First, uh, could you talk um, a bit about the role of economics and cost-benefit analysis in the regulatory impact analysis of FDA tobacco regulations? Oh boy, well, this is not my area. Um, I'm not an economist. Um, and I don't play one on TV, and I would just as soon not be an economist. Um, but as part of the process, um, unless the current administration is totally get, get um, uh, quit, which uh, they seem to be trying to throw, throw out some of these things, um, every regulation that goes forward has to go through an evaluation of what the, um, the uh, costs and the benefits are. And so it's a very involved process. There's a whole group at, at FDA who is a, a, of economists who are expert in looking at this, these issues. And so they will go in and evaluate what appear to be the cost to the, to the companies and the cost to FDA. And then they will also try to calculate the benefits. Now, FDA has had a lot, or, or the Center for Tobacco Products, has had a lot of debate with that group about exactly how you evaluate tobacco. Um, and again, that's not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But the point is, I guess the, the major point is, to a large degree, the economists outside of the Center for Tobacco Products have been more concerned, have not taken into account the benefits of people stopping use of tobacco um, as much as they should in the process. Um, and so, Again, that's not my area, so that's about all of the answer I can, I can provide for that. Thank you very much. Um, returning to a question about guidance, was the guidance that the FDA used to try to get flavored e-cigarette cartridges removed? Is there a danger in the FDA using guidance and that it could encourage bad actors that flout the guidance at the expense of companies that follow the guidance, e.g. Juul? So, good question. So guidance is normally not written in that way that it gives other people advantages. Guidance generally talks about, this is the way FDA reads the statute. This is what, when they read the statute, this is the way that, what they understand it to mean. When companies don't, follow that guidance, they usually suffer from that because FDA will look at that. And unless they can convince FDA that what they've done as an alternative is as good or better than what FDA suggested, FDA will reject their argument. And so, for example, if um, guidance is usually put out in terms of this is the kind of information we need when we are making a decision. And so they will list that evidence. And, and one a good guidance is the guidance for new product review for e-cigarettes. And that's a very good, um, decent guidance that was put out. And so FDA said, this is our current thinking. Now, if a company can show that they can still meet those requirements and not follow that guidance, that's fine. But if they don't follow that guidance, chances are they're not going to meet what FDA needs. And so it is much more in the company's um, uh, the companies have a definite advantage if they meet that guidance because they are more likely to get what they're looking for and what they're trying to get as far as authorization is, is concerned. And so there's really very little advantage in not following FDA guidance. Matter of fact, for most companies that hurts them dramatically. 
Now, as far as the question about the flavors is concerned, again, as I said before, none of those products are on the market legally. So right now, there are no cigarettes on the U.S. market legally. So if FDA chose to enforce the law, every cigarette should, every, excuse me, every e-cigarette should come off the market today. But FDA has chosen to not enforce that law. They put out a guidance that said, we will allow certain ones to stay on the market. So a company that says, I'm not gonna follow that guidance, automatically is subject to FDA enforcement and being removed from the market. That is not an advantage. It's no advantage to ignore that guidance. It's definitely the advantage to try to conform to that guidance and to remain on the market. Great, thank you. Um, uh, there was a question earlier. How do FDA regulations impact small e-cigarette companies versus large e-cigarette companies? Would that be the same? Or are there any different standards based on size of the company? The standards are based on public health. So it's not a question of company size um, in any way. It's all based on public health. Um, but the reality is actually that it's very hard for a small company to be able to meet some of those standards. It's challenging because to prove that a product like that actually has met all the standards that are, that are in the Tobacco Control Act is challenging for a small company. Unfortunately, it's much easier for a large company and that's not FDA's choice. It's actually the uh, people who wrote the Tobacco Control Act um, and the reality of that. But FDA does not look about whether the company's small or the company's large. They look at what the impact is on public health. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, earlier in the presentation, uh, there was a, um, uh, it was alluded that the FDA, that the FDA um, has the interpretation that established tobacco companies have, to some extent, taken over or acquired a large market share of the e-cigarette market. Uh, is the, did the FDA conduct an assessment or use other information to come to that conclusion about the involvement of uh, large established tobacco companies? Um, I think that's... Uh it wasn't anything that FDA had to do and calculate. I mean, there are people out there that follow this, they are e economists and they report these kind of things all the time. So there's a lot of data that's available out there already. Um, I know Wells Fargo used to put out a lot of that data on a regular basis. And it's really basically just going in and, and, and pulling the numbers off of the internet. So there's okay. a study that FDA had to do to evaluate that. Great, thank you. Uh, if a newly deemed product has to be appropriate for the protection of public health, how can it meet that criteria without also meeting the modified risk tobacco product criteria? That is a lower risk than tobacco cigarettes. Okay, so, so there is a difference between new, tobacco, new product application and modified risk application. So the way I've described it in the past and some of the phrase, phraseology we used to do is modified risk is like PMTA on steroids. So first, the first thing a company has to establish is to market a product, it's got to be appropriate for the protection of public health, which means it's got, if, if their authorization is out there, it is likely that that product will improve public health. The death and disease will, be, will go down. So that's one, one decision. And then on top of that, it's the question of, are companies allowed to make modified risk claims? And so that goes basically on top of the new product application, a new product decision. So when decision is made that that product is going to reduce death and disease from tobacco, now we're gonna tell people about it. What happens when we tell people about it? Does that continue to hold? Does it continue to reduce death and disease if the companies are allowed to tell people about it? And so that goes on top. If, so you could have very ha easily have a decision that it is meets the new product standard, but it doesn't meet the modified risk standard. And that was done. That was done with Swedish Snooze. So in the original decision on Swedish Snooze, they were approved as a new product, but their original uh, modified risk claims were not authorized. So Swedish Match did come back with new studies and with new uh, modified risk claims, and eventually FDA decided, yes, now that you've made that modification, um, that, that you can make those modified risk claims. But so you can have a product that meets the new product standard, but doesn't meet the modified risk product standard fairly easily. I don't know, and I cannot imagine that it can meet the modified risk standard and cannot meet the, mod, the new product standard. That's kind of just nonsensical, I think, um, by almost by definition. But they are independent, but I just can't imagine 
that uh, you can meet the, the, the new product, the modified risk standard and not meet the new product standard. Great, thank you. Uh, many tobacco products were introduced to the market after 8-8-2016, which is against FDA rules. When FDA reviews a PMT application for those products, do you think those applications will be subject to a more stringent scrutin scrutiny? Those are really um, apples and oranges. So one is whether the product, as it is being marketed right now, meets FDA's, what FDA has described under guidance, which is, again, it was guidance to allow those products to stay on the market. So that's one enforcement decision. And that's actually in a, a different office um, about, about how those products will be, how that law will be enforced as it is right now. A new product application is something that's separate, and FDA will look at that separately. And so I don't think those two things will have a big impact on each other. If a product has been introduced, particularly a, a new e-cigarette has been introduced on the market after um, 2016, it should come off the market. Um, it's just, uh, I'm not, you know, you can only, I can only guess what's going on at FDA and how they're making decisions about which products to go after and which not. I do see emails all the time where FDA has notified people that they have identified that they were not on the market on February, in, in 2016, in June 2016, and they're pulling them off the market. Maybe it was August 2016, whatever the date was. Um, so I see they have going after those, um, but those are really two separate decisions within the, within the agency. Okay, thank you. Uh, do FDA regulations on tobacco products differ for in-store marketing and online marketing? So, there are no regulations that have been written. I think I'm saying this correct. Don't, don't hold me to it completely. Specifically about online versus in-store marketing. Um, those are very different issues that, that could be important because of youth exposure and the impact of marketing on youth could be different online. If a company has got a, if they actually have, which is questionable, actually have good age verification online and they prevent youth from looking at their marketing online, again, I'm not saying they do or don't, that may be a different situation than having a, a marketing in a store where kids are gonna see it when they go in. Um, so they may be addressed in different ways, not because necessarily there is a regulation in place, but because of the effect of that marketing on youth and its impact on population health by encouraging kids to start using particular products. And so I don't know of anything specific that differentiates between those, but the effect of it could cause differences in the way that FDA um, enforces the law. Great, thank you. Um, with regards to TSNA's levels related to how tobacco leaves are cured, does FDA consider tobacco curing part of the manufacturing process? So that's a very interesting question. So when the law was written, in order to get the law through Congress, farming had to be exempted from the law. And so FDA does not regulate what happens on the farm. Um, they are specifically forbidden for, from dealing with what goes on with, with the farm. But they can deal with what go with, with the final product. So while they can't go on the farm and tell a farmer what they must do or pass a standard saying farmers can only use certain kinds of fertilizer or anything like that, they can not allow particular products to go onto the market if they don't meet certain standards that were caused by what went on on the farm. And so it's kind of an indirect effect. Um, so you're talking about curing. Curing generally is happening on the farm itself and is likely part of the, um, the process of actually um, creating the tobacco and not specifically manufacturing. And so there is that differentiation between those two. Um, I don't know if FDA has made a specific decision about those differences, um, but um, there, um, I would say, I, in my best guess, there is a differentiation where curing would be related to farming and not so much related to manufacturing. Okay, Thank I think you. we are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Ashley, for a great presentation and to our moderator and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience for your participation. 160 people attended the seminar today. Woo. Our 
sister seminar series, the virtual seminar on the economics of risky health behaviors or VERB has a tobacco policy related seminar next week. Ann Burton from Cornell will be speaking on the impact of smoking bans in bars and restaurants. That's on Monday, October 12th at 1130 uh, AM Eastern time. To sign up, you can go to our website, tobaccopolicy.org to our other seminar tab. Don Kankel from Cornell will be our next seminar speaker on October the 16th. His presentation title is Vaping Consumer Preference Perceptions and Advertising. In the meantime, please submit your research before October 13th on tobaccopolicy.org to be considered as a presenter for our winter series. You'll also receive a survey on your satisfaction with the seminar today. We really appreciate the feedback. Thanks again for participating and have a top notch weekend. Thank you.